Welcome to part 10 in a series of video presentations on the drying of fruits and vegetables. In this presentation we will examine solar drying. My name is Don Mercer and I am with the Department of Food Science at the Ontario Agricultural College, University of Guelph. We will begin with several acknowledgments and a brief disclaimer. Then I would like to introduce the topic and explain the principles of operation of solar dryers. We'll look at air circulation and case hardening as well as examining a solar flex dryer which is an example of a larger scale successful solar drying unit. I'd like to examine the potential problems in solar drying and look at solar drying in a two-stage drying process. We'll finish up with some summary comments. I would like to thank Mr. Andrew Goodwin, Associate Industrial Development Expert with the Agribusiness Development Branch of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization for his considerable efforts in coordinating this project. I would also like to thank those who are assisting in the presentation of this material to various local groups. Their contributions to our training activities are greatly appreciated. The author assumes no responsibility nor liability for any problems of any nature encountered through the application of the principles discussed here. This material is intended for instructional purposes only. Solar drying may actually be the oldest form of drying. In nature, small berries often dry on the plants after maturing due to prolonged exposure to the heat of the sun and the effects of the wind. And here we see some dried currants. Due to the removal of water, the berries do not spoil. They also have enhanced sweetness and a chewy texture which can be quite appealing. In this photograph we see some dried blueberries. Recent emphasis on energy efficiency and rising energy costs have resulted in solar drying receiving a great deal of increased interest. In spite of the hype surrounding solar drying, it is not the solution to all of the world's drying problems. Nevertheless, it has significant potential as a tool for use in food preservation. Continuous advancements in solar drying will make it even more important in the future. Solar drying has been successfully applied to the drying of a number of fruits and vegetables. Examples include bananas, carrots, mangoes, yams, tomatoes, and papayas, as well as many others. However, we should not lose track of the limitations of solar drying. We also need to understand the basic principles to use solar drying appropriately. It is not the intention of this brief presentation to provide an exhaustive, detailed description of solar drying. We will introduce the major concepts and discuss some of the problems encountered as well as a few other topics. So let's look at the principles of operation of solar dryers. Solar dryers generally consist of two basic parts. The first is the drying chamber and the second is the heat collector. The drying chamber serves the same purpose as it does on conventional forced air dryers. Here we see a schematic diagram of a solar dryer with its drying chamber and the drying chamber is mounted on legs. The reason for this will become apparent very shortly. Materials to be dried are spread on wire mesh trays or racks in the drying chamber and heated air is passed over them. Instead of using electricity or other fuel sources to provide heat for drying, this is done through the use of a heat collector. There are numerous designs of heat collectors. The fundamental purpose of the heat collector, as its name implies, is to warm the air flowing into the drying chamber of the solar dryer. 
In solar drying, the heat collectors often consist of a series of metal tubes or ducts that warm up the air. Once again, we see the schematic diagram of the drying chamber, but now we're adding the heat collector to the diagram. And this basically consists of a metal duct that travels from the bottom left to the upper right of the diagram, at which point it enters into the drying chamber. So we're actually bringing air up through this duct. It's going to be heated and then pass into the drying chamber where it will go through the bed of material and then it will be removed from the drying chamber. Painting the metal surfaces of the heat collector black and exposing them to the direct rays of the sun will aid in achieving the desired drying temperatures. A glass panel on the front of the drying chamber may also aid in heating the system. This will work much like a greenhouse. If exposure to light is a problem, a metal panel on the front of the unit will also assist in heating the drying chamber. Here is a photograph of a homemade solar dryer that I built and set up in our backyard. What we have is the drying chamber, which is basically the white cabinet here, and the heat collector, which is the large black metal surface in the foreground of the photograph. We have a glass window on the front of the drying chamber to create a greenhouse effect and provide further heating. There are solar powered fans to remove the air from the drying chamber and actually draw air in through the heat collector. The air intake is shown at the bottom of the photograph and you can see how the air will enter and travel up through this metal duct, the surface of which is painted black. And just as an aside, this metal duct surface gets so hot that if you touch it with your hands, you actually risk burning your skin. There will then be material to be dried on this wire mesh rack and the air will travel upwards through the drying chamber and leave through the solar powered exhaust fans. This unit is mounted on a turntable so that during the day the dryer can be kept facing into the sun to maximize the drying efficiency. Since this is a research tool, there is a weighing assembly on top of the drying chamber to monitor the weight of the material on the rack. Many solar dryers rely on the natural flow of heated air through the heat collector section and up through the drying chamber. So here is another homemade solar dryer that does not have any solar powered fans or other methods to encourage the air flow. What happens here is the air goes upwards through the heat collector, through the drying chamber, and leaves through the exhaust stack to the outside of the dryer. This heat collector is actually much longer than you can see in the photograph, but I've cut it off so that you can see the drying chamber itself. And this unit was set up in Equatorial Guinea. There is a serious flaw in this solar drying process since it does rely on the natural flow of heated air through the drying chamber. The direction of airflow relative to the trays or racks must be considered. In this dryer, the upward flow of air can actually be blocked by the material itself. There are no fans to aid in air circulation in this dryer, so that makes it a particular problem. If we add some solar powered fans inside the drying chamber, we can increase the air circulation and velocity. Once again, you've seen this photograph before with the air traveling upwards through the heat collector, in through the drying chamber, and out via the solar powered exhaust fans. But we can put some solar powered fans inside the drying chamber and there are two small fans here that are actually hidden from view and they are black in color which makes them even harder to see. What that does is create a cross flow air direction 
that can help dry both the top and the bottom surfaces of the material more uniformly. Here is an example of another small solar dryer with airflow across the material in this case. What we have is a small drying chamber and a heat collector. The heat collector is coming in from the left hand side and it's just over a meter long and you can only see a portion of it in this photograph. We have a glass window on the front of the drying chamber to create a greenhouse effect and we have an air outlet which I've closed off in this photograph since the dryer was not being used. There is a rack upon which the materials can be placed inside the dryer and I've incorporated a small battery powered fan to enhance the circulation of air in the drying chamber. So the air will come in through the heat collector drawn by the small battery powered fan that will then distribute the air around the drying chamber and eventually the air will leave through the air outlet. We should also briefly mention sample preparation. Samples must be prepared in a manner that takes into account the flow of moisture from the interior of the material to the surface where it will be evaporated. Flat slices are usually the most suitable form in which to dry materials. They should have a moderate thickness which may be in the order of five to six millimeters thick and I've shown some mango slices in this photograph which indeed have a thickness of approximately six millimeters. As mentioned previously, air circulation is a major problem in solar dryers. When the natural flow of air through the heat collector and drying chamber is relied upon, the slow speed of the air and its upward direction can create a situation that is not suitable for effective drying. That gives us a very slow drying process. The air hits mainly on the bottom surface of the lowest pieces of material in the drying chamber. So let's take a look at this in a diagrammatic form. We'll represent the drying chamber by this rectangle. We'll put in some mesh racks which we show as dashed lines and there are four of them in this case and the material to be dried will be placed on the four racks and I've used little orange rectangles to indicate slices of mangoes. The heated air will come in through the bottom of the drying chamber and the exhaust air will leave through the top of the drying chamber. The bottom surfaces on the lowest rack will receive the most amount of drying air. Unfortunately, the top surfaces and materials on the upper racks will receive much less drying air. The air can actually short circuit the material and travel up the sides, the front and the back of the dryer without actually contacting the slices of mangoes as it does make its way through the dryer. In addition, the speed of the air may not be sufficient to carry away the moisture from the surface of the material. We measure the speed of air using an anemometer and in this example we have an anemometer with a little turbine fan that spins faster with increased air velocities. As the fan spins it registers on a digital scale which indicates the linear velocity of the air and in this case it was 0.48 meters per second or almost half a meter per second which is the air velocity that I like to use in forced air dryers. Unfortunately we do not have that level of control in solar drying units. So this is where an understanding of the stagnant boundary layer becomes important. Stagnant boundary layers can reduce the efficiency of drying substantially. What we have is a slice of material which initially has a pool of moisture on its surface and we say that the surface is saturated with moisture. Around this slice of material and its saturated surface we have a layer of air 
that clings to the surface. This is called the stagnant boundary layer. Air in the stagnant boundary layer will soon be holding as much water vapor as it can possibly hold at that temperature. This means the air will also become saturated and it will have a relative humidity of 100%. So no appreciable moisture removal will take place once this happens. Many solar dryer designs fail to recognize the need to disrupt the stagnant boundary layer. This creates an ineffective drying operation as I have already mentioned several times. So the efficiency of the drying process goes down. These problems can be overcome by using solar powered fans placed inside the drying chamber. And once again we see these solar powered fans which I typically use as exhaust fans on the drying chamber for a solar dryer. We want to direct the air across the top and the bottom surfaces of the material to enhance the drying efficiency. So we have already discussed having fans inside the drying chamber in a previous section of this presentation. We've got the air going upwards through the heat collector, being exhausted through the solar powered exhaust fans, and the material being dried will be placed on this rack and by having solar powered fans inside the dryer we can create flows of air across the top and the bottom surfaces. Having the fans blowing or drawing air through the dryer will also increase the air speed. It may reduce the temperature of the air somewhat but as you will find out with experience the air velocity is quite important and you need to balance this with the temperature of the air that you are using. These fans will help disrupt the stagnant boundary layer that forms along the surface of the material being dried. It is important to keep in mind that the basic principles involved in the removal of water from fruits and vegetables in forced air dryers apply to solar drying as well. You must follow the rules. You cannot simply ignore the water removal mechanisms when you switch from forced air drying to solar drying and this is often what happens. So let's take a look at solar drying of some mango slices. In this graph we have the dry basis moisture content of the mango slices on the vertical axis on the left and this is expressed in grams of water per gram of dry solids. The mango slices that we are using had a water content of 84 percent on a wet basis by weight. That corresponds to a dry basis moisture of 5.25 grams of water per gram of dry material that is present in the mango slices. Moving on we can see the constant rate drying period at the beginning of the drying curve and the falling rate drying period a little later on. We'll examine these in more detail in a moment. We also have the target moisture content shown by the red line across the bottom of the graph. Most often we want to have a 10 percent wet basis moisture content in our dried product which corresponds to a dry basis moisture content of approximately 0.11 grams of water per gram of dry solids. So it's a very big difference between 5.25 grams of water per gram of dry solids at the start and 0.11 grams of water per gram of dry solids as our final target moisture. During the constant rate drying period we have the material with a saturated surface meaning that there is a pool of moisture along the top and the bottom surfaces of the slices of material. This will be removed by evaporation as the air passes over the surface and moisture will continuously be traveling from the inner portion 
of the slice to the surface in an effort to keep that moisture pool replenished. However, we will eventually reach a point where there is no longer a surface moisture pool that is present. At this point, we enter into the falling rate drying period where moisture needs to diffuse from the center of the material to the surface where it is evaporated and as time moves on the rate of diffusion gets slower and slower so the rate of moisture removal decreases and we see that as the curve in the drying graph becomes more shallow as time goes on. Some solar dryers actually have such poor airflow that the air trapped inside the dryer becomes saturated with water vapor. When this happens, there can be condensation of moisture on surfaces within the drying chamber itself. I built a dryer which had very poor air circulation and I covered the walls in plastic sheeting. Because the airflow was so poor, the moisture that was going into the air condensed on the inside of the plastic sheeting and you can see the tiny beads of moisture all over the interior surface of the plastic sheeting and you cannot see the apple rings on the wire mesh racks very well at all. This condensation is an indication that something is terribly wrong with the dryer design and its operation. Now we'll move on to case hardening which is another problem that can be associated with solar drying. With some solar dryers the heat inside the drying chamber becomes intense enough to case harden the material being dried. This is due to poor airflow as well as excessive heating. Excessive surface drying creates a tough impermeable outer shell that prevents or restricts moisture loss and this is what we mean by case hardening. It's the development of that tough impermeable outer shell that we are worried about. Often the product feels dry but it is only dry on the surface. Severe problems can occur after storage or packaging. What happens is that over time inside the package the moisture that is trapped inside the case hardened material can diffuse through that outer layer and enter into the air inside the package at which point it can collect on surfaces and then create mold growth. So we want to avoid case hardening at all costs. Here's how normal drying should take place and we'll show this diagrammatically. We'll start off with moisture inside a slice of material. Then we will blow warm air across the surface. Moisture that is moving to the surface of the material will then be removed through the process of evaporation and will leave the dryer as moist exhaust air. However, if we do things improperly and use excessively high temperatures, something different is going to happen. So now what we're doing is looking at very hot air moving across the surface of the material to be dried. This creates a dry outer layer all around the slice which actually shrinks as it dries and that's happening in most cases of drying that the material does shrink but the moisture is trapped inside the shrunken slice of material and there is actually little or no moisture leaving the slices of material while it is in the dryer. So we don't get a high moisture content in the exhaust air, but we do get the development of this dry outer layer around the slice. In this photograph we see a solar flex dryer which was designed and developed by Malnutrition Matters which is based in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And I'd like to show how it operates because I think it illustrates many of the principles in an extremely good manner. Before I do so, I think I should disclose my involvement with this organization. I have personally evaluated the SolarFlex dryer
on a volunteer basis for malnutrition matters and have recommended some design modifications to their early prototypes. No financial nor any other forms of compensation were received for these strictly volunteer services. So let's take a look at this photograph again and see how the solar flex dryer operates. What we have are the two basic parts of a solar dryer. The first is the drying chamber which is this large box-like structure underneath the heat collector device. Inside the drying chamber we have a number of wire mesh racks across which the heated air will be blown to remove moisture from the material that is supported on these wire mesh racks. We also have photovoltaic cells which provide power to a 12 volt battery which in turn powers a series of fans inside the drying chamber that create good air circulation for drying to take place. So the air enters the heat collector from the right hand side and as it travels through this heat collector it is warmed up to a suitable temperature. It then travels downwards as indicated by the arrow on the left through a plenum and goes into the drying chamber. As it travels through the drying chamber the heated air picks up moisture from the material and then is exhausted through vents in the right hand side of the drying chamber. In this photograph the unit is mounted on a turntable so that it can be kept pointed towards the sun throughout the day to optimize the efficiency of the drying operation. There are potential problems associated with solar drying so let's take a look at some of these now. Time is the major problem encountered in solar drying. Many areas have only about six hours per day of suitable conditions for solar drying. My personal experiences have shown that often the morning hours are too damp to be suitable for drying operations to take place and often in the afternoon there are rain showers so net net we end up with only about six hours of time during which moisture is actually being removed from the materials in the solar dryer. Materials such as mangoes may require 10 to 12 hours of drying under ideal conditions in a forest air dryer. In comparison, tomatoes may require 20 to 24 hours of drying under ideal conditions in a forest air drying unit where we have a fan blowing heated air across the surface of the material at a velocity of approximately 0.5 meters per second. Please keep in mind that the conditions within most solar dryers are not as ideal as they are in a forced air drying unit. So here's what can happen if you try to dry mangoes in a solar dryer. We will compare it to what happens in a forced air drying unit. So looking at this graph for mangoes with an 84% initial moisture content we can see what happens. As I mentioned before, 84% moisture on a wet basis by weight corresponds to 5.5 grams of water per gram of dry material in the mango. We have the red line at the bottom of the graph indicating the target moisture content of 10% on a wet basis which corresponds to 0.11 grams of water per gram of dry solids. The time required to reach 10% moisture in this solar drying operation is approximately 17 hours and that can be compared to 10 to 12 hours in a forced air drying unit. Now I have compared the solar dryer and the forced air dryer in this graph. So we have the curve for the solar dryer based on a mathematical model which we created and we have the forest air drying curve which is also based on a model which was created for the drying of mangoes under those conditions. And you can see that there is a difference 
the slope of the curve for the forced air drying is steeper than that of the solar drying model. The time required to reach 10% moisture for the solar dryer is 17 hours and that's compared to 11.5 hours for the mangoes dried in the forced air dryer. What we really need to focus on is that 17 hours required to dry the mango slices in the solar drying unit. We need to recognize that it is not possible to do solar drying for such long periods of time in one stretch. We can't find 17 hours of continuous solar drying conditions. So we need to consider a shorter time frame and I'm going to use a six hour time frame per day which is weather dependent and is frequently what I experienced doing solar drying in several countries. We can then set up a graph divided into six hour drying periods and 18 hour non-drying periods. So here's the graph that we're going to use and what you see here is on day one we have a six hour period during which drying can occur. This leaves 18 hours of non-drying during the first day. In the second day we will have six hours of drying as well plus 18 hours of non-drying. Then we will have a six hour period of drying on the third day followed by 18 hours of non-drying and eventually we will reach the fourth day where we will also have six hours of drying. Once we understand the layout of this graph we can insert the solar drying curve for mangoes and I'm also going to insert the forced air drying curve so that you can compare the two. So moving on we see the graph for the solar drying periods. The blue solid line represents the forced air drying curve for the mangoes to be used for comparative purposes and remember that took approximately 11.5 hours to get the desired finished product moisture. However, looking at the graph, we need to take a look at what happens at the end of six hours of drying in the solar dryer. You can see that we are not anywhere near the final target moisture. However, we will have to hold that material for 18 hours during which it will not dry before we reach the six hour drying period in day two. Once we get into the six hour drying period of day two, the moisture will fall and we will reach a lower level that is still not at the target moisture content. And it should be pointed out that there is enough moisture present in these mango slices at the end of the second day to support microbial growth, in particular mold growth. So we'll hold that material for 18 hours and then do a third day of drying for six hours and at the end of the third day we will reach the 10% target moisture. You will recall that it takes 17 hours of drying for this to take place. So we are almost right at the end of three full days to achieve 17 hours of drying conditions in the solar dryer. We may need four days if the drying is not optimal and that is highly unsatisfactory. Capacity is another issue. You may recall from other video presentations that you only get about 5.6 kilograms of dried tomatoes at 10% moisture if you start with 100 kilograms of tomatoes having an initial water content of 95% by weight. You will get about 17.8 kilograms of dried mango slices with 10% moisture if you start with 100 kilograms of mangoes having an initial moisture content of 84% by weight. And remember that this is 100 kilograms of mango slices and doesn't include the weight of the seeds and the weight of the peels, which are removed prior to the drying operation.
the amount of rocking in a solar dryer necessary to provide a suitable amount of finished product is quite significant. You also need to be concerned about the labor input. There may be a need to repeatedly turn the racks or trays during the drying runs to facilitate uniform water removal. You may also need to move the racks from the top to the bottom if there is an unevenness in the dryer operation, which hopefully there is not. You may also need to remove the material from the dryers overnight to prevent spoilage when there is no solar drying occurring. Now I'd like to consider solar drying in a two-stage process. One potential approach is to use solar drying for the first six hours of the drying process. Then the material can be transferred to a forced air dryer to complete the job. If you have interchangeable trays or racks that fit both the solar and forced air dryers, this will streamline the changeover step and make things move a lot faster. Here we see a graph that shows the combined solar and forced air drying setup. On the left, we have what will occur according to the solar drying model during the first six hours of drying. This brings us down from 5.25 grams of water per gram of dry solids to something like 1.4 or 1.5 grams of water per gram of dry solids at the end of the six hour period. At this time we will do a changeover to the forced air drying and the forced air drying model after the first six hours is shown by the blue curve on this graph. The yellow curve is simply there to show what would happen if we continued the solar drying and did not switch to the forced air drying model. But what we really want to focus on is the first six hours of solar drying with that dashed green line and then follow the solid blue line for the forced air drying down for the last portion of the process. And we will then note where this blue line crosses the target moisture line which is indicated in red and that occurs at approximately 13.5 hours. The first six hours of this time require no fuel input so the energy efficiency is quite favorable. And the time for the overall drying process when compared to solar drying alone is reduced from three days to 13.5 hours. So I think that this is a viable option that should be pursued in a solar drying operation. In summary then, solar drying offers an energy efficient method of moisture removal from fruits and vegetables. It has certain limitations that must be addressed, but these are not insurmountable. The most common errors made in solar drying are related to ignoring the factors that are critical in most drying operations. They are the time that it takes to dry things. Remember that drying is a time dependent process. You really can't rush it. The air temperature is important. You need to have an air temperature that is high enough to support the evaporation of moisture from the surfaces of the material but that is not so excessive as to create case hardening. You also need a high enough air velocity to disrupt the stagnant boundary layer and you also need enough fresh air coming into the dryer that the air does not become saturated and cause condensation on the inner surfaces of the dryer chamber. And of course we need to worry about sample preparation. Solar drying may be a viable first stage for a two-stage drying process when coupled with a forced air dryer. And before jumping into solar drying, you must examine its compatibility with your materials and your final product requirements. Thank you very much.